Hi students, welcome to HSC Chemistry and the Organic Chemistry module and this is the last video, video number 35 uh, from this particular module. It's also the last one in our series on polymers and the last in our look at condensation polymers. So in the previous video we looked at nylon, this time we're going to look at polyester. No need to go through this in a lot of detail because as usual we're looking at the structure, the properties and the use and this time we're going to focus on polyester. One of the things that we need to do when we're looking at polyester is to get a bit of a sense of what's actually happening in terms of the polymerization process and I kind of flagged this a little bit in a previous video when I, looked, when I talked about the fact that um, we were able to produce our esters uh, by reacting an acid, uh, a carboxylic acid and an alcohol group. And when we put these together, we were able to get our ester, but we also produced water. Water was a byproduct of the esterification process. And of course, we also talked about the fact that it was an equilibrium and so on and so forth. So we've, we've got a little bit of experience with this type of thing before. And of course, there's no reason why you can't duplicate the esterification process over and over again as we would um, for any other polymerization process in order to make a very long chain uh, compound which has um, uh, these repeated units within it. Now, as you saw for nylon when we were looking at using two different monomer units, one of the key things for us to do that is to ensure that the functional group actually occurs at both ends of the molecule because if the functional group occurs at both ends of the molecule, then potentially um, these reactions can occur at both ends of the molecule. And in fact, that's what we want. If there was just a terminal end and nothing on the opposite end, then that itself would terminate and we wouldn't be able to polymerize or we'd only be able to uh, react one end of that molecule rather than both. So you can see ethylene glycol uh, or antifreeze. This is one of the simple um, kinds of alcohols. You can see it's two carbons, so it's ethanol, but because of the two OH groups, it would be ethendiol, and we want to make sure that we identify the position of those, so ethan 12 diol The terephthalic acid is a little more complex. Hopefully you're starting to get a sense that this messy structure in here is the benzene uh, ring and then you can see that we've got this uh, carboxylic acid group on uh, attached to either end of the benzene ring. What this does is it gives us a quite complex polymer, uh, this thing called polyethylene terephthalate. Now this may not appear to be something that you are previously familiar with, but if I tell you that um, the PET bottles that we often use for um, soft drinks, for example, uh, are made of polyethylene terephthalate, then you'll know that this is a compound that you are very familiar with. So um, PET is the uh, contracted version of this polymer, and you can see that it qualifies as a condensation polymer because there is a small molecule that is released as a part of the process of this particular molecule. As we have previously, um, we've had a quick look at the structure of PET. Now let's go into in a little bit more detail, which is looking at some of the properties. Again, because the molecule is relatively compressed, the benzene ring does increase its volume a little bit, but uh, these ones are fairly regular and therefore they're crystalline. It's a thermoplastic, which means we can melt it and then reshape it, which is really important for um, the fabric uses that we have of something like polyester. But it is a rigid um, plastic uh, with some level of elasticity. In the same way as most other polymers are, it's chemically inert, so it's reasonably stable. That's one of the reasons, if you think about plastics generally, what we what we do find with a lot of plastics is they are very resistant to heat, to water, to uh, chemicals being spilt on them. Obviously, if it's a very um, strong concentrated acid solution, well, not too many things are going to stand up to that. Uh, but, but for most of the different substances that we are likely to uh, encounter on a daily basis, these polymers are pretty resistant to most of the, the, the chemical attacks that could occur. 
as with a lot of the polymers as well, uh, polyester is non-biodegradable, so it doesn't break down. And, and one thing you would be aware of, uh, which we haven't really had to look at too much, but we might cover a little bit more in our final module, um, is the crisis that we have around plastics. The amount of plastic that is now a day-to-day -day part of our lives uh, is really creating a problem because of the um, lack of breakdown of these plastics because they're so chemically inert, because they're so stable, they don't break down. So they stay around for long periods of time. And I'm sure you've seen images of, of plastic islands in the ocean and some of the damage that, that plastics can do to our um, sea life and also to um, our waterways, our roads, um, just our, our general landfill. So <clears throat> plastics, whilst they've saved us a huge amount of time and also a lot of money, they've replaced a lot of more expensive options for some of our containers and some of our fabrics. Um, they've also created um, some challenges uh, associated with their use. And of course that brings us to the table for the very last time. The opportunity that you have to look again at the two monomers that are going to be part of this process um, to put little structural formulas together to get a sense of what polyester looks like, how those um, monomers combine together to form the polymer, and of course make sure you tick off your properties and uses and see as much as possible. It doesn't matter if you don't have a huge list of properties and uses. What I think is really important is that you pick a specific use for each of these polymers and then identify the properties mm. that make it specifically useful for that purpose. So where you can relate the two things together, I think that's the most important thing. These particular polymers have these particular properties and mm. therefore this is why um, we can use them in this particular way. Have a look. I think this table is a great way, if you can fill this in, to summarise pretty much this whole section on polymers, and it should give you a really good uh, kickstart for making sure that you can cover any of the questions that you may get around uh, polymer chemistry. Good luck, and thanks for watching.